What I think is pretty fascinating is that our body is able to maintain a very narrow and constant range of blood glucose in our body. So notably about 60 to 150 milligrams of glucose per deciliter of blood. And it's not important that you know this exact number, but what I think is significant is that in contrast to something like free fatty acids, for example, which we'll talk about in fatty acid metabolism, fatty acids can range almost tenfold depending on the needs of the body. So they can either be really, really high or really, really low. But glucose always stays within a very constant range. I'm say blood glucose level here. And it's important that this is a very constant range, of course, because there are some tissues in our body, such as our brain and some of the cells in our eyes and our kidneys and even our red blood cells that rely on glucose nearly exclusively to produce ATP. So remember, once glucose is in the blood, it can be used by any of the cells in our body through process process of cellular respiration to produce ATP. So remember, the three big steps of cellular respiration are first glycolysis, the breakdown of glucose, and then the glucose goes to the Krebs cycle, where it undergoes some more oxidation to release all of that energy in the glucose molecule. And finally, the byproducts of glycolysis and in Krebs cycle go to the electron transport chain, which is able to produce ATP in bulk amount. So how does our body keep this blood glucose in such a narrow range and constant range in our body? So our body is able to do this differently depending on kind of what state the body is in. So the body can be either in the fed state or our body can be in something that we call a fasted state. So you can imagine kind of the fed state as being just after you've eaten a meal. So let's say you've eaten a chocolate chip cookie. The glucose that has been broken up in your GI tract can then be used to directly contribute to this blood glucose level. And then of course the glucose can be used by our cells. Now in the fasted state, so imagine that this is basically all the times you're not eating, the body has come up with kind of two different ways to regulate blood glucose levels. So now remember that in the fasting state, our body needs a way to essentially pump glucose into the blood to keep it at this level, essentially to replace the glucose that's being used up by our cells because we don't have this constant intake from you know, our chocolate chip cookie. So in this case, our body has glycogen, which is a polymer or kind of like essentially a string of glucose molecules that it essentially stores away and our body actually kind of ingeniously makes this glycogen by using some of that glucose that is dumped into our body during the fed state so kind of in anticipation of knowing that it's not always going to get glucose from eating it kind of preserves some of it in this glycogen molecule and most of this glycogen molecule is actually just as a fun fact located in your liver which is why your liver is very very important for carbohydrate metabolism and so in times of fasting our body can actually go ahead and break down this glycogen into the individual glucose molecules which then can be used to keep our blood glucose levels constant. So unfortunately, it turns out that this mechanism of breaking down glycogen only lasts for about 10 to 18 hours in our body. That is to say that after 10 to 18 hours, we've essentially used up all of our glycogen stores and we'd need to eat another meal to kind of build those glycogen stores back up. So you can imagine during an overnight fast, for example, so, you know, when you go to sleep and, you know, it's usually about, you know, hopefully eight to 10 hours. And so you can imagine there's a point during the day when your body needs another way of producing glucose. And so our body has come up with a second way called gluconeogenesis, which is indeed the topic of this video. And gluconeogenesis is exactly what its name implies. It is the genesis or creation of neo, new, glucose. Now, it's actually quite fascinating just to kind of think about this for a moment. What, what we're saying in gluconeogenesis is essentially our body is taking precursor molecules that are from a non-carbohydrate source. So essentially it looks at what it has lying around and notably 
most commonly it uses amino acids in our body as well as a molecule called lactate which is produced as kind of a byproduct um, oftentimes um, in exercising muscle cells and it takes kind of these precursor molecules and reconfigures them to produce glucose and it's this glucose that can then be used to be dumped into our blood to maintain this constant blood glucose concentration and a constant supply of ATP for our tissues. So now that you kind of have a big picture of carbohydrate metabolism and where gluconeogenesis fits in, let's go ahead and talk about, as promised in this video, about this metabolic pathway, gluconeogenesis. So in order to do this, I think most effectively, it's actually important to revisit glycolysis briefly. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring up the reaction diagram that was used to explain glycolysis in a previous video. So just to orient you, remember that glycolysis begins with glucose up here, and glucose is broken down in a series of steps. You know, most notably at, at one point, it's broken down into this three carbon molecule, glyceraldehyde three phosphate, and then it is broken down even further and reconfigured, releasing some ATP and NADH along the way and ultimately forming this molecule pyruvate. And pyruvate is a very important molecule because it can continue to the Krebs cycle where it can be further oxidized to produce more NADH that can be used by the electron transport chain to produce ATP. All right, so that was kind of a big mouthful, but just remember, big picture, glycolysis, breaking down glucose into pyruvate. Turns out, the way I like to think about gluconeogenesis is that the goal of gluconeogenesis is to produce glucose. And so essentially the way I like to think about it is that gluconeogenesis is almost the exact reverse pathway of glycolysis, that is to say, we start at this end of the reaction pathway, we start with pyruvate, and we essentially go funnel back the opposite direction through all of these reactions to produce glucose. Now, the key word is that it's almost the exact reverse of glycolysis, and it's almost the reverse because I wanna call attention to these orange arrows. So note that there are kind of three orange arrows. So one from glucose to this molecule glucose 6-phosphate, another one here, and then one at the very end, which converts the last molecule to pyruvate. And what's important to note about these reactions in glycolysis is that unlike the other bi-directional black arrows that are used in most of the reactions, these orange arrows are unidirectional. What they're trying to indicate is that these three reactions are irreversible. In other words, they have a negative, if we pull out a fancy term from chemistry, they have a negative delta G value or a negative Gibbs free energy, which means that if we were to reverse these particular reactions, we would have to flip the sign, right? And so these negative delta G values would become positive. And that's problematic, right? Because we know that in order for any biological reaction to occur, we must have a negative delta G value. So our body has come up with a bit of a compromise. Our body has essentially said, okay, look, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven reactions with these kind of bi-directional black arrows that are essentially reversible. That is to say they have a delta G value that's near zero. And so they can go either direction. So our body says, okay, we'll keep those seven reactions. But in going from pyruvate back to glucose, we have to come up with a different reaction pathway for the three steps that are irreversible. So that's exactly what our body did. And in fact, that's what I'll go ahead and review in the remainder of this video. But essentially you can say, with those three steps in mind, we're just performing the reverse of glycolysis. 